Hey folks, we're back for part two of differential amplifiers. And we are going to look at the AC analysis of these little guys. All right, let's start off with the um, circuit that we had last time. Using a couple of uh, bipolar transistors here and PNs. We had a little tail current source. Right. We have two Ks on here, five Ks up here, 15 volt power supply, or 10K, and a negative 20.7 volt source down here. And if you recall, we had done a calculation that turned out that um, the collector currents, I'm not going to refer to them as I1 or you know, I2, There's, ideally everything should be matched. That's going to be a milliamp, right? And our uh, DC collector voltage worked out to 10 volts, right? We had a milliamp times the 5K, so that gave us a 5 volt drop from the 15. So... VC1 is equal to VC2 is equal to 10 volts. Okay. Now in the AC case, all right, we're going to add AC sources out here. As I said, this is a differential amplifier. So we have two inputs. Right, this is via number two on this side and on this side via number one. So what we would like to do is use superposition on this. What we're going to do is figure out contribution at the output, one of the two collectors, uh, from VN number one, and then we'll do it for VN number two. We'll see what we wind up with. Okay, add the two pieces together and we've got the total result. All right, so let's consider VN one first. We'll start over here. So in superposition, we're going to short out the other source, right? Replace it with its ideal internal impedance. What do we wind up with? Well, we wind up with something that kind of looks like this. Here's VN number one. I'm going to replace our transistor, uh, transistors, excuse me, with their model. So our simplified model is we have an R prime E over here and a current source for the transistor. Now that goes off to the 5K this one and this comes down now the current source basically this thing is going to open up an ideal current source is going to have a huge internal impedance uh, so we can basically say that opens up it disappears now in this case with a 10k it's not exactly true but you will see that it's a decent approximation even though it's not perfect at least for the numbers that we have here so we kind of leave that as an open and now we're looking into the emitter of the second transistor. So over there, we'll see that R prime E, right? And then this junction is our current source, which goes off to the other RC value, right? The other 5K out here. And then of course the base resistor hanging off there. Okay. Before we sort of launch into this, we need to know a value for R prime E. Well, R prime E is always 26 millivolts over IE. IE and IC are approximately the same. So that's roughly 26 ohms. Right? 26, 26. So my first question is, if I have a nice sine wave coming in over here, what do I wind up with on this collector? What do I wind up with on this collector? All right, looking out this way, in other words, input, output over there on the same collector. What kind of a configuration do we have? Well, that is pretty much an ordinary common emitter amplifier. The only wrinkle is instead of this point going to ground or maybe a swapping resistor, it's got this extra thing over here. Well, what is this? This is basically a common base amplifier, All right? Base is common. So I need to know what's the emitter uh, impedance. In other words, what's, what's the Z in 
emitter to this second stage because this is going to act as the impedance to ground from this point. Kind of like a swapping resistor almost. Well, it turns out that that's roughly speaking R prime E. Um, RB does play a small role here, but because we're looking at a much smaller current flowing through there, it's actually divided down by beta. So um, really it's R prime E. When we calculate the gain for this, right, the gain equation in general is going to be a negative RC over R prime E plus RE, right, for a swapped case. Well, your RC over here is just this 5K. Your R prime E is the 26 ohms. And then your RE is really this other uh, Zn emitter, which is 26 ohms. Now, if you want to write this as a nice equation, right, you could say, well, this R prime E and this RE are basically the same size. So you could write this as an, uh, an equation that's negative RC over 2 R prime E. Or if you prefer, 1 half RC over R prime E. Anyway, uh, we got 5K over 52 ohms. So that is going to uh, be just a little less than 100, right? You know, like 96-ish. Uh, Let's just say that for that gain. It is, of course, inverting. Put a little note there. If that's my input phase, my output phase looks like that. Right? It's just about 100 times bigger. So 1 millivolt in, 100 millivolts out. That's what we're looking at on that end. What about this collector? Okay, well, the first thing I'm going to say is, for a common base amplifier, the gain is non-inverting, and it's equal to RC over R prime E. However, we don't get the entire signal coming in because, in fact, we have a little voltage divider effect going between these two R'E's. In other words, the signal that's actually coming in is Vn times this Zn emitter, R'E, over the total to R'E. In other words, you only get half the signal because these two R'E's are the same size. So you get this hey, look what we have. It's the same equation, except there's no minus sign. So again, we're going to get roughly 96, but it's non-inverted. So if that's my input phase, my output phase matches. So what we see at the two collectors is the identical signal, ideally, but one is an antiphase. Now, that by itself is actually useful. We could just stop there and say, well, I don't even need another, uh, another V in, right? I just take two outputs, one from each collector. And what we have is something called a phase splitter. So a phase splitter is a circuit that produces two identical outputs, one that's an antiphase to the other, right? You have a sort of a normal or in phase by in phase, we just mean in phase with the input signal, and a flipped or inverted output. But they should be identical in size. We'll actually see a use of this soon enough. Okay, great. Now, let us continue with the other input. In other words, now let us consider VN number two. Well, you know what? If this is a mirror image, we get the same exact analysis. It's just that our perspective changes. So what we saw looking at VN one is that the same collector is inverted. The opposite collector has same phase. So if I consider VN number two, same collector will be inverted opposite collector will be in phase. Which means if I have over here on its input an identical input signal, right, driving in, I'm not going to redraw this with a, uh, a source signal right back here in the base, uh, 
But if we had that phase, then on the same transistor, we get antiphase. And on the opposite side, the other transistor, we get same phase. So these amplitudes should be identical. In other words, if we had one millivolt in, we should get 96 millivolts out, whether it's the black or the blue. So what's an inverted 96 millivolt sine wave with a, a normal 96 millivolt sine wave when you add them together? They cancel. You get nothing. Same thing over here. You get big fat zero. And now you're thinking, well, what the heck use is that? Turns out it can be really useful. But before we look at that, let's take the case where the second base is flipped. So here's my original phase. Here's my flipped phase. Now what happens? Well, these blue things are flipped upside down. So we get that over there, and we get this over here. Well, now, in this case, these things add. Right? Kind of go like this. We get twice the output. So if the two inputs are in antiphase, the net gain for this thing is just RC over R prime E rather than 2 R prime E. Right? Because these two things add up and we get double the signal. Well, that's kind of interesting, right? It's kind of like, you know, it's a double gain. Okay. These two versions, the red and the blue, are very important. So the red version, right, where we have um, identical, excuse me, where we have inverted phase on this second input, that's referred to as a differential input. And what we see is we're going to see a big output. We're going to see a big signal. We're going to have an appropriate gain, you know, depending on what the resistor values are. On the other hand, if we had the thing I did in blue, where they're identical, we call that a common mode input. In other words, the same input is common, right? The same signal is common to both inputs. And what we see there is that the signal essentially cancels. Okay? All right. How well does this really work? And, you know, what's an application for it? Well, the accuracy of this really goes back to what we were talking about with the DC analysis. How well matched are the two halves? You know, if they're not perfectly matched, guess what? The gain from one side is not going to be exactly equal to the gain on the other side. So mm, the cancellation or the additions, the cancellations are actually more important, um, won't be perfect. You know, so you won't have these two things perfectly give you zero or those two things perfectly give you zero. In the ideal case, if you have a common mode input, the output has perfect cancellation so the output is zero. Now what that tells you is you only wind up multiplying a differential input. Differences between the inputs are what are multiplied. So we can write a gain equation for this whole circuit. What should the output voltage be? And by output I'm referring to one of the two collectors. Well, V out should be you know, a gain, right, this RC over R prime E thing, um, times, here's the important bit, one input minus the other. Now I can call this, I'm going to call this V plus and V minus. And by plus and minus, what I mean is the phase relative, right? What's this phase relative to the output? So if I was talking about, let's say, this output, Right, this collector is the output. A positive going signal here is positive going here. Right, so that would be the V plus. The inverting would be this guy. He would be the V minus. On the other hand, if we were using this as our output, 
then, right, this is going to be in phase from Vn, and it's going to be out of phase relative to V2. In other words, the pluses and minuses would shift. So there's a, if there's a different signal, right, we'll get some kind of amplification. If the two signals are identical, ideally we get nothing. This is extremely useful when we start talking about um, trying to get rid of noise. What we will do is make a phase splitter. And I'm going to run this down through a whole bunch of twisted pair cable. So these two signals are basically identical. And all twisted pair cable is is just two conductors, and they're just sort of spun around each other, and there's an outside coax. And then this goes into my differential amplifier which I'm just going to draw as a little diamond over here. Okay, so it's got my V plus and my V minus. Here's the cool thing. You throw in a signal, all right? So here's, here's your, um, your nice sine wave that you applied back here. Well, the phase splitter gives you this and this, okay? So that's a differential signal. What should I get out of this amplifier? Well, the difference between these two, and the difference, of course, between sine and minus sine is to sine, right? Sine minus a minus sine is to sine. So we see a nice big signal out here. But if we have a common mode signal, and where would we get the common mode signal? We would get the common mode signal from some kind of induced noise. That would be induced into the two lines equally. So let's say, right, let's say that this guy is, you know, this line. This one should look like this. Well, if there's a noise spike, like if we have some switching, switching machines or something like that, that spike is going to be induced ideally same amplitude, same phase in both wires. So let's just say at this negative peak we get a sudden spike. Well, at that same instant in time, we're going to see a spike like this. Right? They're both positive spikes. But that's a common mode signal. So this part of the spike is subtracted from this part of the spike, and they cancel out. And what we're left with is a nice pristine sine wave that we started with. It's brilliant. Now, how good is it in the real world? Right? How, how good is the matching? Well, we come up with something called common mode rejection ratio. Right, figure of merit. That's a lot of syllables to put together, so we just call that CMRR, which is a little bit of a tongue twister itself. So CMRR basically is a ratio between what you would have gotten in this system versus um, the um, you know, non-differential. So if I have, let's say, uh, use some nice round numbers here. Let's say my signal is one millivolt and my noise spike is eh, not drawn to scale. Let's just say it's 10 millivolts. And let's just say that the differential gain over here is 1, just to keep the numbers easy. Well, we should just get 1 millivolt out of here, okay, if the differential gain is 1. Okay. The matching, however, will not be perfect, so we will get something out of there. Well, let's say your CMRR, and this is not very good, but let's just say it's 100. What this means is it will suppress the spike by a factor of 100. So instead of that 10 millivolts going through and getting a gain of 1, it's going to go through, right? So the, the, the V common mode gets multiplied by the gain, but then it gets divided by the CMRR. 
So you've got 10 millivolts times a gain of 1. Common mode rejection ratio is 100. So what you wind up with is a tenth of a millivolt. So you started with something that was 10 times bigger than your signal. And if this was a constant thing, like if this was uh, like a broadband noise or a hum or something, it would just drown out your original signal. It would be terrible. Um, but out of this system, you have a, a signal that's much, much smaller. Right? You have a, a noise signal, this, this garbage, this interference, that's 10 times smaller. Well, that's great. And that's only with a common mode rejection ratio of 100. You know, a, a decent amplifier, if you actually take care in designing this thing, common mode rejection ratios are measured in the tens, hundreds of thousands. You know, big numbers. As a matter of fact, we normally talk about a common mode rejection ratio in decibels, CMRR prime, where, you know, 100 dB would not be a crazy number. Right? That's a voltage ratio, so, you know, 20 log 10. So we're looking at like 10 to the fifth, right? 100,000. If that was the case here, right? And we like bumped these up and we said, oh, this is a volt. And the noise signal is 10 volts. Wow. But I have 100 dB, which like I said, works out to 10 to the fifth. You would say with a gain of one over here, one volt times one, I've got one volt of signal. But my noise would be 10 volts times the gain of 1 divided by 10 to the fifth. You know, so you're looking, you're looking at microvolts for this thing. Okay? Well, that's beautiful. I've got a 1 volt of signal, and I've got microvolts for, for uh, my noise spike. Fantastic. So we use this system in uh, communications quite a bit. If we're going to send signals down long wires where there's possibilities of you know picking up noise and so forth a differential drive signal is very very useful it's not going to do anything about noise that occurs back here right you know this because what's going to happen is any noise you have back here just goes through the phase splitter and you have an inverted version and it's just treated as a differential signal but it's for noise that's coming in you know from the outside right induced noise works great but that's not all but that's not all folks there's more turns out this differential design is extraordinarily useful if we couple this circuit in with some more elements some more stages we add on to this we can do some really nice stuff and that's really where we start talking about operational amplifiers but we're going to save that for the next video. Before we go, though, there are a couple of refinements I would like to point out. And that would be things like you might see little resistors in here, which would be swapping resistors to lower distortion. And, you know, you would just add that in to your equation over here, right? It would be 2 times R prime E plus the, the real swapping resistor. I'll call it RSW. How's that? Um, you might have Darlington's back here to crank up that uh, that beta. You might have FETs, right? Field effect transistors to make really, really high input impedances. There are other kinds of configurations we might use. As far as the uh, current source, you know, we might use very common, as it turns out, in op amps. Uh, we might use some kind of uh, current mirror configuration to get a really really high impedance ultimately that impedance of this current source is going to play a role in establishing your common mode rejection ratio the higher this is the better your common re common mode rejection ratio is going to be so you need that you also need really good matching if you want a good cmrr so those are all possibilities all right so i think that's enough to digest for now Right? You can try some of these examples in the, uh, in the text, try some of the, some of the problems. And it's uh, a nice circuit to, to do a simulation on. Right? You can do a transient analysis on this. Um, look at this output node, look at that output node. 
pay a lot of attention to what the phase shifts are doing, drive it with one signal, ground the other, flip it, you know, put the signal here, and then do that. Now, one practical point before we go, if you're going to test common mode, the way you would do that, you wouldn't literally try to get two function generators in lab. You would just get one function generator. I'm not going to draw the whole circuit here. And what you would do is you would just jump it over to the other one, right? So this way you guarantee you have a common mode input. And you can put a nice big common mode signal in there, measure your collector voltage, see what you get. Ideally it's zero, but you know, in reality it's not going to be. This is the technique that's used in the lab manual, right? When we look at the diff amp, first we do a DC, then we do an AC, and this is exactly what we're going to do, which uh, you could either build that or you could simulate that. All right, so next time we'll sort of shift. We'll take this. We'll add some stuff to it. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. It's going to be amazing.